We're a little past time to get started tonight. We had some issues we were working out back there, but we're good to go now, I think. Uh, our opening uh, song will be led by Brother Randall Nunnally, and then he will also lead our invitation song. And then uh, our opening prayer will be led by Brother Mike Morton. Uh, the only announcement that I have that was not made Sunday was Carrie Rose uh, Smith, that's Deb Bray's sister, is in the hospital in, uh, at Princeton. She suffered a light heart attack. And so they're treating her for that, and they're also treating her or will be treating her for some other issues that she has. You should have gotten the uh, update. Uh, so there were, I think, three on there that we wanted to remember in prayer especially. And I don't know of any. Is there anything, anyone else that we need to add to our sick list or announce tonight? If not, we'll go ahead and open up with a prayer. Following that, we'll have our song. And then I'll do our devotional, and then we'll dismiss the classes. Please bow. Holy Father, we're so thankful that we can come and we can our best and we can our families by studying your word. We pray, Father, that you'll be able to mark and mind and lessons that they have prepared and are preparing. Father, we pray for Jeff Shapiro Smith and we can with her and they can do anything they can for her to treat her. And we pray that you'll be with the Evans family and lost of Sister Brenda. Larry, the invitation will be 903. Uh, you, Larry, so you have to use the book for the first one. It will be 417. 417, where he leads, I'll follow. Sing the first verse. Sweet are the promises, kind is the word, dearer far than any message man ever heard. Pure was the mind of Christ, in let's I see. He, the great example, is a pattern. Where he leads, I'll follow, follow all the way. Where he leads, I'll follow, follow Jesus every day. In my office, I have a file where I have stored a number of things that little kids have given me through the years. They'll take down notes during the sermon and then pass them back to me, or they'll make things and hand them to me, and I treasure those things. They're, they're valuable to me, and so I save them. I put them, put them in a file folder and keep them. Well, a brother by the name of uh, Keith Hahn, he said, that, or rather Alan Hahn, uh, he said that he had something like that on one occasion. He said, uh, years ago, a little girl handed me a piece of paper with a brief note scribbled on it. And he said, I don't remember the girl's name. But as he went on in his little writing, he said, I do remember the message. The message that she had written was simply this, to you from, and then he couldn't remember the girl's name, to you from, I love you. He went on to come in. He said it was a simple note, it was a direct note, and it was an appreciated note. And sometimes those are, are very valuable to you. Brother Hun goes on to make the point that it doesn't take much to brighten someone's day, to make them feel better. And he challenged others to go ahead and use those small gestures, such as maybe giving a phone call or, or maybe doing a, a little short note and brightening someone's day. But as I continued thinking about what I'd read from Brother Hun, I remembered what we find in the book of Romans, chapter 5, at verse number 8. There the Bible simply says, But God shows his love for us, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. You know, if a simple gesture can do so much to brighten a person's day, how much more should the cross do for us? to brighten our day when we think about that. Every time we think about the cross, 
it should mean a lot to us. It, it, ought to, it ought to help us to appreciate God even more. Because you see what the message of the cross is, is, is this. To you, and fill in your name, from God, I love you. To you from God, I love you. Tonight, we simply ask the question, do you need to respond to God's love? Because of what Jesus has done on the cross, you can have forgiveness of sins. It may be tonight you need to be baptized for the remission of your sins, or it may be tonight that you need to come back and ask for prayers and for restoration in the Lord's church. Whatever the case may be, if you need to respond in a public way tonight, do it right now as we stand, as we sing. Go. The first time I ever taught in this auditorium, first time that Zella Wyndham had ever heard me teach, when I got up before I could get started, she said, We sure are glad to have you teaching us today. I remember that like it was yesterday. And that reminded me of it when Mark said what he did. So, Continuing on in our study of why people suffer, again, the lessons were taken from this little book by Brother Dave Miller and Why We Suffer, and there's where you can get a, order a copy of it if you would like. So, what brought all this on was, of course, is this pandemic that we've been through and going through, and all the suffering that goes on along with it. And... Along with that suffering, something naturally comes about, and that is we start asking ourselves, well, why, why, are, why, why are we suffering? Why is there so much suffering in the world? And then as we carry that, again, as we carry that on to its conclusions, other questions come up. And then we also have those individuals in the world with us today who try to fortify those things. That is, is if I'm suffering like I am, you know, either God's not all loving or either he's not all powerful. If he was, he wouldn't let me experience this and he would keep keep me from suffering the way I am. And then, you know, if that's the case, then he's, he's probably not the creator like some folks say that he's not. And the problem with all that is is that then we may carry that too far and wind up eternally lost because it will break your faith if we let it. So we need to know why we're suffering. Why is it that people suffer? So last week, and week four a little bit too, I think, we, we made this observation is, is that life is temporary. The Hebrew writer said, and just as it appointed once for man to die once, and after that comes the judgment. So after we die comes the judgment. We are judged as where we will spend eternity. And there is absolutely nothing that we can do between death and the judgment to change that. Whatever condition I'm in when I die, then that's going to dictate how God's going to judge me and where he's going to direct me to for eternity. So, I only get one shot at preparing myself for eternity. That's all I get. 
When death comes, it stops. Now, then if I'm living this life in this world, why am I here? Why did God put me on this earth? What's the purpose of life, in other words? What's it all about? Well, Dr. Miller, again, Dr. Miller in his book says to give every person an opportunity to decide where they will spend eternity. Now, the thing I want us to look at inside his definition here is is that we decide where we're going to spend eternity. And we do that during this life. So, a little bit further with that. Spend it on some. My life is a proven ground providing me an opportunity to choose through my own free will where I will spend eternity. Now, there's some big words and big ideas in this, this definition here. Proven ground, opportunity to choose, and my own free will. And we're going to look at some of those tonight. So, if this thing called my own free will or free moral agency is so important, what is it? See, we really need to know what free moral agency is. We need to know and understand that I have my own free will. I can choose as I freely want to. And that's a, listen to this, that is a God-given right. Further than that, it is a God-given blessing. Think about it just a minute. What if you couldn't choose, make the choices in your life? What if God made all the choices for you? Where would your happiness level be today if you suddenly lost your right to make your own choices. We don't realize, really, until we think about it, just how great a blessing that we have because we can make our own free choices. We can choose whatever we want to choose. And think about this too. God loved us so much that he wanted to make sure that we could make our own choices, even at the risk of God losing us as much as he wanted us. He loved us enough that he didn't make us puppets. He didn't make us robots. He gave us our own free will to make our own choices. So, this all started back in the beginning. Look at Genesis 2, 16 through 17. And the Lord God commanded the man, that's Adam of course, saying, you may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the fruit of knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you Eat of it, you shall surely die. Now look what's contained in this, okay? What is he saying when he says, you may surely eat of every tree? What's God doing for Adam and for Eve when he makes the statement to him? Well, Adam and Eve, I got a bunch of trees out here in the garden for you. He said every tree, that's plural, that's a multiple number, that's a number that I can make a choice about, or Adam could have. So what God is saying to Adam here is, I have put a number of trees in this garden that I've given you, and you can choose at your own free will to eat of whichever one you want to. 
That's free moral agency. That's giving Adam the freedom to make whichever choice he wants to of eating whichever tree he wants to. He didn't say, Adam, here is a bunch of trees in the garden. I have made you and fixed you where you can only eat of this one and this one and this and these others. You can't do it. They're there, but you can't eat of them because I have programmed you so that you can't. You don't have a choice. He didn't do that, did he? He said, you can, you're free to make your choice of any tree here that you want to eat. We'll move on down to verse 17 now. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. He's told him there is one tree in that garden that he shall not eat. Let me ask you something. Did he say, you can't eat of that tree? Did he say, I have programmed you, made you such that there is no way that you can eat of that tree? And do that, did he? He said, you shall not eat. Look at the rest of that. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. See, even though God told Adam and told Eve, do not eat of this tree, knowledge of good and evil, he still gave them the choice as to whether or not to eat of it. If you don't believe you did, just look at the world we live in today. So when God started out with mankind, the first two individuals on earth, he gave them the free moral agency or the right to freely choose as they wanted to choose. Now, somebody says, well, there are certain reasons that I choose things sometimes. Well, here's Adam. He's got God here that's given him all this, this garden to live in, given him everything, made everything so good for him, and he's got the Satan here, or the devil, that's pumping him full of misinformation, trying to pump his pride up, and then he's got his wife here in front of him that's also influencing him to eat this fruit. Did he have any pressures on him in making this decision? Well, sure he did. But he was free to choose whatever he wanted to do, to eat of that fruit or to not. Didn't matter how much pressure either or the three of those individuals made on him, it was still at the end of the day his decision. No matter how strong that influence, it was his decision to make. And that's what that's the blessing that God gave him. See? Even though God had told him not to, he was still free to choose to eat of that fruit. And God knew that if I give Adam the choice, if I give man the choice of right or wrong, as much as I don't want to lose any of them, I know I will. But I love them enough that I want to give them the choice to choose. And that's what he did. Move on down to Joshua. Joshua talking to the, his people, he said, And if it is evil in your eyes to serve the Lord... Choose this day whom you will serve, whether it's the gods of your father served in the region beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. What's he doing here? He's telling these people they have the freedom of choice to serve whichever God they're going to serve. Sir, it's their choice. They have the right to freely choose. Then Joshua said, I chose. I had the freedom to choose just like you. 
I chose the Lord. So as we move on down through the, to the Bible, we see this, this free will agency. Well, let's look at this a little bit. All of us, when we get up first thing in the morning, we're going to make a thousand choices that day. Because when I get up in the morning, I got to choose what shirt I'm going to wear. And you know what? If I got two shirts, I can choose whichever one I want to wear that day. I can. I've not been programmed, I've not been hogtied. To whether to where I've got to wear a certain shirt. And that's just a trivial choice. But the thing about it is, every day we make thousands of choices, even though we don't think about it. We make thousands of choices, all the way from trivial choices to catastrophic choices. And God loved us enough that he gave us the blessing and the liberty and the right to make those choices for ourselves. You see, when I come to a forks in the road, a choice in other words, I have the blessing given to me by God to make whichever choice I want to make. I can go to the right or I can go to the left. It's my choice. Now, I may have a lot of influences, a lot of pressures that are bearing down on me. But still, at the end of the day, at the end of the decision, I choose what I, I make my own choice. It's my, I can freely make that choice. Now you tell me, how much of a blessing is that? When you really get to thinking about it, as I go through this life, what if that was taken away from me? What if I was just like a robot that moved at the command of something else? So God has given me and you the right to choose as we see fit. And guess what? God don't force me to take either road, left or right. Whether it's a little trivial road to take or whether it's one of those significant decisions in life or whether it's one of those catastrophic decisions in life. He don't force me to go each way. It's my decision. What a blessing. Now let's look at, look at it this way. I come to a forks in the road in my life or I come to a choice. I come to where I've got to make a choice one way or the other. It could be a wise choice or an unwise choice. Or it could be a choice that's godly or one that's sinful. Or it could be one that's right or wrong. Or it could be just a good choice or a bad choice. Or one that just don't really have much matter on my life anyway. But wherever those choices are, from the most important choices that we have to make down to nothings, it's my choice. It's my choice. I can, yes, I can be influenced. I can have pressure on me, but it's still 
and the end of my choice. Now let's just pull a curtain back. See, every choice that we make may very well have this effect. We don't know it, but it might. But again, it's my choice. Now, I know I live in this world just like it, like the rest of you do. And I know I've heard these, and I know you have too. But it was an offer I couldn't refuse. That's the reason I made the choice I did. I just couldn't refuse it. Or it would cost me too much. That's the reason I didn't do the right thing. Just too costly for me. You know, in economically or socially or politically or whatever. Or I would lose too much. If I made this decision, I'd lose too much financially, materially or whatever. He or she'd hate me for it. it. May cause problems between me and my wife, me and my parents. So I couldn't make the right choice. And I loved it too much. I went one click too many, but I loved it too much. So here's what we got. If we want to understand why this there's suffering in this world, we got to understand that we have the right to choose. We are free moral agents. We make choices that we want to make, or we make choices. We have the right to choose. May not want to make the choice at the time, but we may. It is our right and our blessing to make those choices. So, we looked at earlier why God, or that God loved us so much. And this free moral agency is one of those evidences that he loved us that much. He also gave us immortality or a life beyond this physical realm. Now, this audience understands this, so it don't, re- it don't require any kind of defense right now. But did you, un- did you realize that man is the only creature God created to live with him in the afterlife? It's the only thing that God created such a way that would remain with him for eternity. And he gave me the free moral agency to determine if I was or not. I make that decision. He made me so that I could live, so that he could live with me through eternity. And he gave me the choice as to whether or not I was going to. Because he gave me the free right to make choices. See, I'm not like a rover. I'm not dead all over when I die. God loved me enough that he didn't want me to be dead all over when I die. He wanted me to live with him through eternity. And through his free moral agency, he gave me that decision to make. Along with that, he gave me the culpability for my own choices. In other words, I I reap the benefits of my choices or I reap the consequences of my choices. Somebody says, well, that ain't good. That's not a loving God. But when you look at this, that's motive for making good choices. And he gave me this physical life as my one and only 
probationary period for eternity. See, now, we're on probation in this life. God has us on probation. And we're going to look at that a little bit closer. So we're not going to leave it. Some of you are familiar with this hit that the Statler's made. He's getting me ready. That's what this life is for. That's what this probation period is for, is to get me ready to live with him. Now, another thing is that he gives us the recognition that my eternal fate is based on my response to him. Now, what do we mean by that? My eternal fate or my where I will spend eternity, whether I spend it with God or other, is determined by my free will choices in regard to God's love. So he gave me that. He put me on this earth, in this earth for this probationary period. Well, what does it provide me? This earth provides me with a place where I have the opportunity to decide where I will spend eternity. How? What? How is it that this being on this earth or what is it that it supplies me with enable for me to live like I should in this probationary period? Number one, it gives me my basic physical needs. It gives me what I need to sustain me during this period, during this probation period, during my physical life. It does that for me. It also gives me the opportunity to use my freedom of choice. See, if it wasn't for this life, we wouldn't have an opportunity to choose. But he's given me this life and put me on this earth that supports that life so that I have the opportunity to make my choices or use my free will agency. Now, during this opportunity, when I'm making choices, this earth has supplied me with challenges, challenges that make or challenges me to make decisions, make choices that would prompt me into conforming to God's will. In other words, I get the dry run. I get the exercise of dealing with challenges. Somebody says, well, a good God wouldn't put challenges in front of me. But yeah, when you get through all of the mess, pull the curtain back, challenges is what makes us, reminds us of God. Challenges is what reminds us of life as temporary and that sort of thing. Yeah. You don't think God puts that there's challenges out there? Look at Psalms 23 and 4. Valley of the shadow of death. There's a challenge. You've got death on your mind. You're close to death. You know that this life is, is temporary and the end is maybe close. Look at 1 Peter 5 and 7. Casting all your anxieties on him. There's some more challenges. These things that causes us anxiety, they're challenges. They're things that we've got to make a choice over. And you know what? I get to make the choice. I mean, I want to, but I'm free to make a choice 
of however I'm going to deal with these anxieties. John 16, 33. You will have tribulation. All these tribulations are challenges that I face in this life. <clears throat> All these tribulations are challenges. Make forces me to make decisions. Decisions which I can freely make. Romans 5 and 3. Suffering produces endurance. Suffering. It's another challenge. It's another thing or another challenge that makes me, forces me to make decisions. Free will choices. James 1 and 12. Man who remains steadfast under trial. But when he has stood the test. All these trials that we go through in life, all which are nothing but challenges. This world that God has put us in has provided the atmosphere and the condition so that we will face these challenges. That's the way he designed it. And in addition to that, he's given us evidence that I really need so that I can enter life, future life with God. So it's his nature, the Bible, life's experiences. Through these challenges, through these life experiences, I learn about God and what he's done and doing for me. So, Let's put all this on one screen so we can get the parish, not lose track of it. This world or this earth that God has put me in, it provides my physical needs to sustain me during my probationary period. It provides me with the opportunity to make my own decisions. It forces me to make decisions. And in those decisions and choices I've got to make, there are those that provide challenges, like some of them we listed. And I've got to respond to those by making a choice. And then, of course, it gives us evidence of a future life. These are the things that this earth gives us that this place that God put us in this physical life gives us. Everything we need to prepare ourselves to meet God. Now, why did he? Why did he give me these things? Why did he put me here on this earth and the things that it provides and the, the life that we live? Why did he do it? Because given these things, given the, that it sustains physical life, given that it makes me make choices, given that there's challenges out there in those choices, given that I know that there's, there's a future life out there, I can shape my soul so that I am fit to live with God. This earth, this universe that we live in, this life that we live, the central purpose is to shape my soul for future life. Put an asterisk up there by this. This is one of those other concepts we need to keep in mind as we move through this. You see, man thinks that there's, we're here on earth for other reasons. The world does. Most of mankind does. Most of which is for pleasure. See, the world thinks that, we were, that we're on this earth, we're in this life, to enjoy life. Well, there's nothing wrong with that. It's not that God don't want us to enjoy life, but it is not God's primary purpose 
for us being here. Our primary purpose for being here is so that I can, I can get myself ready to live with Him. It's to shape my soul so that it'll be fit to live with Him. And as such, as we're in this world, in this period of time when we are shaping ourselves, molding ourselves so that we can be fit to live with God, see, we're in a probationary period. Right now, I'm on probation. I'm living, I'm living my life such that I can live with God later. And I'm having to show that. See, I got the choice. I can choose to live my life in such a way that God would have me live with Him in the future. But I also have that choice where if I don't want to deal with God, where if I don't want to do the things God wants me to, where if I think this world and this life is nothing but pleasure, then I can make that choice and I won't live with Him in the future. But it's my choice. And right now, this life is the time that I make that choice. I'm on probation. Let's illustrate that or try to. Let's look at a parolee that's on parole, okay? He comes to the point in his life where he's got to make a decision. He's got people over here, maybe it's his old cohorts that he got in trouble with that's trying to get him in one going in another direction. Here's the parole board over here who has instructed him how he is supposed to live his life Here's his family, maybe, that's trying to get him to live his life so that the parole board will, will give him freedom. See, here he is, and he's being influenced. He's being pulled both ways as to which way he's going to go, the decisions he's going to make. Well, if he makes the wrong decision, if he goes along with his old poor ho- if he just freely chooses, now wait a minute, he's got these people influencing him. But still, at the end of the day, it's his choice. And if he chooses not to live by the parole board's laws, well, you know as well as I do, he's carted off to prison in chains. But can he blame it on his old core whore? I'm not going to try that again. Can he blame it on his old buddies? Put a lot of pressure on him to make that decision. No. See, yeah, maybe he did. Maybe he came under a tremendous amount of pressure. But the thing about it is, it was his choice. He didn't have to do what they said. But on the other hand, if he chooses to live by the parole board's Laws. And he's free to go and he breaks those chains. Now look at you and I. Same situation, okay? Same thing. You and I today are in that probationary period just like that parolee was. And we got decisions to make just like him. Maybe I got the world out here that's just really coming down on top of me. But you know what? Don't matter how much, it's still my choice. I got to make that choice. And I'm free to do it. And just like the parolee, if I choose not to live by God's laws, that I'm like him. I'm carted off in chains. But then, too, just like him, 
if I make the right decisions, the right choices, free choices, to live by God's law, then I'm carted off to heaven and free of the chains, just like him. But the main thing is, I'm free to choose which way I go. And it's my choice. God hadn't intervened. God has not programmed me where I'm going to go either place. doesn't matter what I choose. He loved me enough that he gave me the choice to do what I wanted to with my life. Now, he put some challenges out there to make me think about it and to help me guide back to him. But still, it's my choice. Again, a recap. I don't want to lose the forest for the trees. It's not intended to be a permanent place. It's a probationary period to shape my soul to God's way of living. I'm molded. I have a chance to mold myself by the choices I make so that God would want to live me live with me in eternity. Yes, He gives me challenges. Like we talked about earlier, natural disasters, pandemics, human cruelties. All of them remind me that life is brief and it's uncertain and makes me think of God. It teaches me, these challenges that I've run into, that life puts in me, it teaches me that everything is temporary. But yet there is something out there that's permanent. Guess what? People complain about the conditions that they're in when they are suffering the reverses of life, challenges. But you know what? God's giving you the ideal environment so that you'll have the opportunity to make the free will choice to accept or reject His will. See, even though there are problems in this world, even though there are cruelties in this world, this world is the ideal environment for us to mold our souls in so that God would want to live with us in the future. Somebody say, well, you're crazy. Anybody make a statement like that's crazy. Well, if you're looking at it from the paradigm that this place is for fun, for enjoyment, and that's the reason we're here, Yeah, but if you're looking at it for the way God purposed it, a place where I can be challenged to mold myself into something he would want, then it's I'm spot on. Well, we've also been subjected to tragic events and things. Why? Why? Because these sufferings are all necessary, common to God, common to his ideal environment, of shaping my soul. Keep that in mind. And we're going to put this up here just for thought between now and the next time. Think about this, okay? What makes us more aware that life on earth is temporary and uncertain than the suffering from the natural disasters and the diseases we face. Can you think of anything else 
that brings to mind with more impact and more often than what the natural disasters and the diseases do. And then brings to mind to us that we need something more than ourselves. Think about that, and that's where we'll go next time. If you would, bow with me. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this opportunity you've given us to come here and to study your word. Pray that we might be able to absorb what's been taught tonight in the classes and that we might carry it out in our everyday lives. Be with us as we go out in the world, and we ask these blessings in Christ's name. Amen.